Good evening, everybody. My name is Joe Guerrera, Executive Director of the Lehigh Valley Heritage Museum here in Allentown, Pennsylvania, coming to you live as we wait for this big storm, Snowzilla, to move into the Lehigh Valley. Well, the last couple of years have been pretty easy on us when it comes to winter weather. Last year, we barely got our snow blowers going. This year, I fear they're going to be running for a long time. But anyway, we are, so, we are so delighted, we are so happy to have all of you with us here. You know, the beauty of these programs is we are not only reaching our local members, but we have people on tonight from Illinois, California, Florida, and Virginia that I certainly know of. And I want to thank all of you for making all of this possible. It's, it's really a delight to be here and to have all of you with me. Um, anybody that's attended our lectures here on Saturdays in the past certainly knows the name Peter Kern. Peter Kern could always fill the lecture gallery, and he's really one of the most knowledgeable people I've ever met in my life. Uh, he has advanced knowledge of chemistry, astronomy, geology, He's one of these people that can talk about anything. He is the ultimate dinner party guest, the type of guy you'd like to have over because whatever you want to talk about, he's going to know plenty about it. He served as a hospital president, a zinc mine manager. He has advanced degrees in uh, geology and chemistry. He's a mathematician. And he's the hardest guy for me to ever introduce, and I'll tell you why because he always takes me down a notch or two. He's so modest. He says, Joe, just let me go up there and start talking, but I really can't do that. Tonight, he's going to be talking to us about a subject that has been an intricate part of his life since he was a child. He has a set of books with him tonight that his mother gave him, I think, when he was like 12 or 13 years old. And so his program tonight, he's going to talk about history and poetry. Some people might say, well, gee, what is a historical museum doing with a program on poetry? The title of the program tonight is Poetry, What It Teaches Us About History, by Peter Kern, our great friend and a friend to all people. Let's give Peter Kern a nice round of applause. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Joe, and I'm, I'm in very impressive company here with uh, President Lincoln right at my side. Uh, this is not going to be a uh, poetry reading. I hope uh, anyone who tuned in uh, and worried about that, that it was going to be a poetry reading, uh, no, the answer is no, it's not. Uh, on the other hand, I will take the opportunity to read certain segments where I believe it is important to hear what it's all about. But before I start, uh, Jill asked me the question, Jill Yunkin, the assistant director here, asked me the question, uh, what got you involved in poetry? What got you interested in poetry? Well, about once a year around this time, my brother, who's two years younger than I am, calls me up and says, remember that poem that mother used to read to us around this time of the year about the Arab? He says, do you still remember it? I said, you mean, Abu ben Adam, may his tribe increase, awoke one night from a deep dream of peace and saw within the moonlight in his room making it rich and like a lily in bloom. An angel writing in a book of gold. Exceeding peace had made Ben Adam bold, and to the presence in the room he said, What writest thou? The vision raised its head, and with a look made of all sweet accord, answered the names of those who love the Lord. And is mine one, said Abu? Nay, not so, replied the angel. Abu spoke more low, but cheerily still, and said, I pray thee then, write me as one that loves his fellow men. 
The angel wrote and vanished. The next night it came again with a great wakening light and showed the names of those whom love of God had blessed. And lo, Ben Adam's name led all the rest. Now, she taught us that 70 years ago. It's burned into my memory. I haven't forgotten it. My brother calls me up and asks me to repeat it at least once a year. So I start off by telling you that's what got me involved in poetry. My mother was the, uh, shall I say, the educator in the family. My father was the breadwinner. My mother bought us books. My mother saw that we once, once a week would go to the supermarket and pick up a Funkin' Wagnalls encyclopedia from A to B or from C to D and bring it home for 99 cents a, a book. Those We cherished those when we were kids. So I, I guess what I'm saying to each and every one of you is that there is something, there is someone that uh, has had an influence on you and when it comes to poetry it was my mother. So I want to talk a little bit about poetry and and what it is that it teaches us about history. Because we take it for granted that poetry is, uh, poetry is just poetry, it's just words. It's not. There's a definition. I want to read you the definition of poetry. It's a literary work in which special intensity is given to the expression of feelings and ideas by use of distinctive style and rhythm. That according to the dictionary. That's the definition of poetry. What I prefer is the definition that I found in a children's book on poetry. Poetry is music in language. Think about that. Music in language. That says it all in three words. Now why do I mention that? I mention that because poetry goes back at least 5,000 years, although most of what we know about poetry comes from Homer and the Iliad, and the Odyssey, two, two great poems that he wrote uh, around 750, 760 BC. The Iliad, 16,000 lines long. We don't think of it as a poem, but it is a poem. And Homer, uh, if you want to put Homer's picture up there, Cayenne, uh, we'll show uh, someone what Homer looks like. Uh, at least what they think he looks like. He was a blind poet. Uh, most of what he, he told about poetry was told verbally. There were no written books, very few. In fact, the only fragments we have on the Iliad date from about 300 BC. But he wrote the, the poem, uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, they're epic poems, 16,000 lines long. Can you imagine, 16,000 lines? And they're written, they're written in verse. They're not prose. They're not, they're not in, in uh, what we would consider to be uh, storybook uh, writing. They are written in a very strict meter. And the reason for that was because they were told verbally. And it made it a lot easier for the teller to speak the, the poem uh, if it had a meter. So they're really, they're historical in a sense that they tell us a little bit about what happened back 700 BC, but they're really more, uh, shall I say, uh, stories. They're not really accurate. We don't know with any degree of, of, uh, of precision how accurate they might be. But the interesting thing that I found was that the first word in the Iliad basically is sing. Sing. Remember I said that poetry is music in language. He starts off the Iliad with the word sing. Now, what is he singing about? He's not singing about Troy. A lot of people think he was singing about Troy. He's singing about the rage of Achilles. It really, it's a story of Achilles, the great warrior. And if we can show uh, Achilles, I think we might have a picture of him someplace. Uh, there he is. Uh, a lot of these are images that came from, from uh, uh, various pottery shards and the like. But Achilles is the, is the hero, so to speak, the protagonist 
in the and there's very little there's very little in the in the Iliad about the Trojan horse. We we anyone who thinks about the Iliad thinks about the Trojan horse. Very little is written about the Trojan horse. I'll get on to that a little later. And it wasn't the face that launched a thousand ships. We think of Helen as the face that launched a thousand ships. That was Christopher Marlowe's description 2,000 years later when he, wrote, when he wrote a poem. He wrote about her and said it was the face that, that launched a thousand ships. But what we have is hardly what we call a definitive history, but it tells us a little bit about the era. Now we can kind of fast forward about oh, eight or nine hundred years to the early days of Rome. Now we have a great Roman poet by the name of Publius Virgilius Maro. Uh, Virgil is spelled both ways. The British prefer with an E, the Americans prefer it with an I. But Virgil wrote the Aeneid. Now the Aeneid is a much shorter poem. It's only 10,000 lines long as opposed to 16,000. And it was written about 25 BC. Now, the first words in the Aeneid are in Latin, arma virumque cano, I sing of arms and the man. I sing. What? It seems like they're preoccupied with singing. Why? Because these were lyrical. These poems were lyrical in their nature. Now that literally means I sing of arms and the man. More loosely, it, what, what Virgil was saying is I'm going to tell you a story about a hero and his exploits. And what he does is he describes the fall of Troy. See, Homer never did that. That all happens after. And what Virgil was trying to do was to set the tone for the founding of the Roman Empire. And so he, he had this great hero, Aeneas. And now we have a picture of Aeneas, uh, Cayenne. Uh, I'm sure we do. There he is. He's got his father on his shoulder. He carried his father out of Troy and his young son along with him. He was a, a Trojan hero. He's mentioned in the Iliad, but only briefly. But he escapes from, from Troy sails across the Mediterranean. Uh, we're probably uh, well aware of the fact that uh, uh, he fell in love with a uh, woman by the name of Dido, over in, uh, or Dido, depending on how you pronounce it, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, Africa, the north coast of Africa, Carthage. Uh, he left her there and she subsequently was so distraught that she committed suicide. But the point is, he, he knew he had a mission to accomplish, and that was to found the, the beginnings of the Roman Empire, and that would have been about six or 700 BC. That was the time frame that this is about, although Virgil himself wrote it about 25 BC. So he's writing a little bit of a history. Now, those are, again, they're stories, they're not meant to be accurate histories, but they tell us about the era. Now we do have historians at the same time. We have people like Herodotus in the Greek who wrote tremendous histories. We have Plutarch uh, among the Romans who wrote great histories, but they were not written in, in, uh, in, in verse. They were, prose, they were prose writings. So I'm not gonna focus on them at all. But we move ahead about, oh, thousand years now, and the British come along. Well, we call them the British. It's the British Isles, and we have Beowulf. Now we have Beowulf next. I think Beowulf is coming. Oh, there's Beowulf. Beowulf is, is uh, <clears throat> things are getting shorter. We're down to 3,200 lines. Uh, listen, we have, and they, and they start off by saying, listen. They don't say sing. They say, listen. We have heard of the might of kings. And it's an old epic poem that has been researched uh, thoroughly by a number of, uh, of great uh, uh, researchers. But these were, again, not well documented because they all occurred before the advent of the printing press. 
So whatever was written down, if it was prior to, to the, the Romans, it might have been written on papyrus, it might have been on tablets. Uh, by the time we get to, uh, to Beowulf, uh, there were scribes who were, who were writing these stories down and illustrating them, but they were not readily available to the average person. By the time of Shakespeare, however, the printed page had become commonplace and poetry became more widely available as a means of expressing emotion or experience. Remember, that was the original definition, emotion or experience, and that's really what, what uh, Shakespeare was, was recognized for. Uh, virtually every line in his plays is written in meter. They're not written in prose, they're written in verse. So they're, all, they're largely poetic in structure. His, his expressions are short. Who do we have next, uh, uh, Cayenne? Let me see what we have. There he is. That's the bard. That's the bard. And he, uh, he, was, he was very, uh, shall I say, uh, well aware of the importance of words. Very, uh, shall I say, knowledgeable. And he said, uh, you can go on uh, to the next one. That's John Milton, but before we get to Milton, I'm just going to mention, Shakespeare wrote, and again, he, said, he says it very well in one of his sonnets when he talks about the importance of the written word. He says, not marble nor the gilded monuments of princes shall outlive this powerful rhyme, shall outlive this powerful rhyme. So all of those marble marble monuments, the gilded monuments, those are, are things that will disappear with time, but the word will not. And Shakespeare was very aware of that. Epic poetry continued. Milton is next, I believe. We had Milton there. John Milton wrote. Again, they got back to writing these, uh, shall I say, epics. And Milton wrote uh, Paradise Lost, total of 10,000 lines. Uh, I don't think anybody uh, uh, has actually counted them. I'm sure that somebody has, but there's 10,000 lines. And Alexander Pope, the great Alexander Pope, uh, he wrote uh, The Rape of the Lock. I loved it. When I was, a, when I was in, in school, I said, oh, it sounds very sexy. I want to read that one. Well, what it's about, go back, go back, uh, go back to Alexander Pope, if, a minute, Cayenne, if you can, there he is. He wrote this, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a poem, it's a sarcastic poem, actually, about 2,500 lines long, about the lover who sneaks in at night and snips off a lock of his lover's hair. And it's, it's a, it's a, it's almost a sarcastic uh, treatment of, uh, of these very profound uh, poems that were written before him. He also wrote what I consider to be one of the great lines in, in, uh, in the uh, uh, poetic, uh, I love this one, if you don't mind. A little learning is a dangerous thing. Well, gee, when I first heard that I said, that doesn't sound right. A little learning is a dangerous thing. Shallow drafts intoxicate the brain. It makes you feel more confident in your subject, especially with the ease with which we Google today. <laughs> so we, we should not be too happy. We should not be too happy to have a little bit of learning because a little bit of learning is dangerous. It says, Deep, drink deeply. If you're going to learn anything, drink deeply. And that was something that, you know, we should read those. We should read those essays, and, uh, and that's an essay, by the way, not a, not a poem, but that's an essay. But I always found it was, it was a very profound statement. When you, when you analyze it, it's a very profound statement. Next, uh, Cayenne. Oh, we've got the Lord Byron. Man had a way with words, uh, and I know that uh, uh, he, he was, uh, uh, and I'm trying to go through these 
in, in a chronological order so that you get some idea of how we're getting to where we are today. <clears throat> Byron wrote, he wrote many things, uh, uh, but the one that, that always stuck in my mind simply for its, its beauty of, of words was the destruction of Sennacherib. Now Sennacherib is mentioned in the Bible and uh, the, the Persians were trying to, uh, to uh, overcome the, uh, the, the Hebrew nation. And uh, Sennacherib was, uh, was the, was the uh, uh, shall I say, the, the, the focal point of, of this. And, and what, what Byron says in the first four lines, and when you think about the beauty of words, the Assyrian came down like the wolf on the fold, and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold. And the sheen of their spears was like stars on the sea, when the blue wave rolls nightly on deep Galilee." Now, in four lines, he sets that whole scene for you. Now, there are very few, there are very few people who can, who can capture that the way he did. For the angel of death spread his wings on the blast and breathed in the face of the foe as he passed. And the eyes of the sleepers waxed deadly and chill, and their hearts but once heaved and forever grew still. Again, four lines and he can tell the whole thing. So I think that, that again, these were, these were choice, choice uh, historical events that poets were trying to, uh, shall I say, memorialize. Now this was back in the early 1800s, that Byron, Byron Lee. Then we get to uh, William Blake, is it William Blake's next? Yeah, I think William Blake, I love William Blake. William Blake, if you haven't read William Blake, you should, uh, you should read him. William Blake, William Blake. What has William Blake written? Anybody know? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? That's beauty. That is, that is so profound in four, four lines. He can, he can make an expression like that that literally grabs you. Now children love that poem. And it, it is a difficult poem to analyze. It, it comes in, in six stanzas. But when you look at it in depth, it's very profound. But yet children can understand it and love it. I'm going to move on a little bit because I do want to get to some of the more important, what I consider, social commentaries that come along a little later. But what we're getting to now is we're getting to a time when poets became aware of the power of what they could say when, uh, shall I say, uh, an event took place, uh, and I'll ask you, I'll ask, uh, if, I, if I had an audience here in front of me, I'm sure some of you can tell me where the uh, Tennyson, we have Tennyson up next, by the way, is Tennyson next? I think Tennyson is next. Cayenne, are you there? There we go. No, oh, it's Ralph Waldo Emerson. Sorry, I slipped ahead. All right, leave Ralph up there. I want, to, I want Ralph. I'm sorry. My mistake. Let me do Ralph Waldo Emerson because I keep them in sequence. Ralph Waldo Emerson, we all have heard of him. We studied him as, uh, as students. But he wrote a wonderful poem for the dedication of the monument at the Battle of Bunker Hill. And he wrote the following, at the, it's called Concord Hymn. By the rude bridge that arched the flood, their flag to April's breeze unfurled, here once the embattled farmer stood and fired the shot heard round the world. The foe long since in silence slept, alike the conqueror silent sleeps. And time the ruined bridge has swept down the dark stream which seaward creeps. 
on this green bank, by this soft stream, we set today a votive stone, that memory may their deed redeem, when like our sires, our sons are gone. Spirit that made those heroes dare to die and leave their children free, bid time and nature gently spare the shaft we raise to them and thee. Set it all in 16 lines. It is, it is the fitting tribute to an event that, that was seminal in, in the Revolutionary War. The bridge is not there. It was swept away years ago, but they put a monument up to, to, uh, to memorialize it. So we have Emerson, and now we're going to move on to something that I'm sure almost all of us have heard when we were students, the famous words, listen my children and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. He said to his friends, if the British march by land or sea from the town tonight, Hang a lantern aloft in the belfry arch of the north church tower as a signal light. One if by land, and two if by sea. And I on the opposite shore will be ready to ride and spread the alarm through every Middlesex village and farm for the country folk to be up and to arm. Now it goes on, it goes on for another two pages, and I'm not going to read that. I'd like to, but it's, uh, I don't want... I don't want, I told you I didn't want this to be a poetry reading, but it is, it is important. It closes, he closes by saying, So through the night rode Paul Revere, and so through the night went his cry of alarm to every Middlesex village and farm. A cry of defiance and not of fear, a voice in the darkness, a knock at the door, and a word that shall echo forevermore. For born on the night wind of the past, through all our history to the last, in the hour of darkness and peril and need, the people will waken and listen to hear the hurrying hoofbeats of that steed and the midnight message of Paul Revere. Now, that is a, a piece of history that Longfellow memorialized in a, in a very relatively brief poem relatively brief poem, but he got it all down so that we as, we as children, when we were, when we were well, at least I, I can remember as a child, learning that or hearing it spoken and thinking, now I know about history. I know about the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. It wasn't because I read it in some history book. I heard Longfellow's poem, which said it all. And that's the beauty, the beauty of, of, of poetry is that it can tell a story in a very succinct and meaningful way. We're going to move on just a little bit to, uh, and again, I, I think the next one is Walt Whitman. Do I have Walt Whitman coming up next? Yes, I do. America's Poet, America's Poet, jo and one of Joe's favorites. I mean, uh, I can't, uh, I can't, say enough about Walt Whitman, and I can't say enough about his famous tribute to Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Whitman had worked in the hospitals during the Civil War. He knew blood, he knew suffering. He was uh, well aware of the great tragedy that was unfolding during the Civil War. And that tragedy was compounded when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. And shortly after that, Walt Whitman wrote this poem, which probably is more moving than any book that might have been written on the circumstances surrounding the assassination. And he titled it, O Captain, My Captain. 
And if you don't mind, I will read this one in its entirety because I think it is important. O oh, Captain, my Captain, our fearful trip is done. The ship has weathered every rack, the prize we sought is won. The port is near, the bells I hear, the people all exulting. While follow eyes to steady keel, the vessel grim and daring. But O oh, heart, 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 O oh, the bleeding drops of red, where on the deck my captain lies, fallen, cold and dead. O oh, captain, my captain, rise up and hear the bells. Rise up, for you the flag is flung, for you the bugle trills, for you bouquets and ribboned wreaths, for you the shores are crowding. For you they call the swaying mass, their eager faces turning. Here, captain, dear father, this arm beneath your head, it is some dream that on the deck you've fallen cold and dead. My captain does not answer. His lips are pale and still. My father does not feel my arm. He has no pulse nor will. The ship is anchored safe and sound, its voyage closed and done. From fearful trip, the victor ship comes in with object one. Exalt, O shores, and ring, O bells. But I, with mournful tread, walk the deck my captain lies, fallen, cold, and dead. How can you improve on that as a tribute to Abraham Lincoln? I mean, it's, it's something that, that I'm sure if he had been alive to hear it, he would have, he would have wept just at the words. Because they are, they are, shall I say, spoken, number one, from the heart. And number two, they're spoken with, with such beauty and such, uh, shall I say, uh, feeling. And only Whitman could do that. Alfred Lord Tennyson. There's a question. I've got a question now. I'm going to move on. Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote, again, the problem with, with trying to do this chronologically is that uh, there's a lot of overlap between poets in, in this particular era. Uh, Tennyson was, uh, was a great poet. Uh, he wrote, he wrote a, uh, uh, a very moving poem to a battle that took place in the Crimea. Uh, when the British were fighting the Russians. For whatever reason they were fighting the Russians, I don't think anyone fully understood, but they were fighting them nonetheless. Go on to the next one. Okay. It's called The Charge of the Light Brigade. Who hasn't heard this one? Half a league, half a league, half a league onward. All in the valley of death rode the 600. Forward, the light brigade, charge for the guns, he said. Into the valley of death rode the 600. This goes on, it's, six, it's, it's, not, it's not an overly lengthy poem, but I'm not going to read the whole thing. But I, I think, again, it tells a little story about how, how the, uh, the history of an event can be memorialized in a poem. Very briefly. And this one had a tremendous impact on the people that heard it. And it became a social commentary. When can their glory fade? Oh, the wild charge they made. All the world wondered. Honor the charge they made. Honor the Light Brigade, Noble 600. This was uh, one of Tennyson's most famous poems, certainly not, not his best poem, but one of his most famous poems. And uh, I'll ask a question, see who can uh, give me the answer if we have this. Uh, are we going to have an interaction later on, Joe? Yeah, we're going to have some questions. Okay, well, who can tell me uh, what movie uh, had uh, this uh, poem written in? Uh, that was part of, very, uh, an important part of the movie. Uh, and it was in charge of the Light Brigade with Errol Flynn. It wasn't that one. But it was a, a recent movie, and someone should know who it was. I, I'd like to give them an award, Joe, but uh, uh, I, I'm afraid to, uh, to
to, uh, to that there might be a hundred people who show up who know the answer. <laughs> and it might be violating the gaming laws. Oh, it might be <laughs> violating the gaming laws. That's right. That's right. Probably all. But alive. anyway, uh, I'd like to know if anybody, if anyone knows the movie in which the Charge of the Light Brigade was a prominent, a prominent part of the of the of the motion picture. <clears throat> We move on to Emma Lazarus. Who knows who Emma Lazarus is? Oh, there's Emma. Emma was the daughter of uh, Jewish merchants. Uh, they were, uh, I think, m most, most likely of Portuguese descent. They'd come over here early. Uh, she was uh, well read, uh, well ac ac acknowledged as a, as, a, as a writer and as a poet. And she wrote, she wrote uh, a poem. I'm going to give you a little bit of background first. Uh, let's have the next slide. Uh, there it is. That's a good one. She wrote a poem called The New Colossus. Now, everyone should know what she was writing about, but I'm going to read it to you while we have a picture of the old Colossus right in front of us. This is the old Colossus. She's writing about the new Colossus. And she says, Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch, whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name mother of exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. You know she was writing about. It's the next slide. And it's obvious. When the French gave us this wonderful gift to mark the 100th anniversary of the independence of the United States, they gave us the pieces which we had to put together. By the way, they were brown. They were all brown. I mean, they were all copper color. Uh, there's, uh, you know, it's it's rather it's rather amusing that there is a color now called Statue of Liberty green. But I will tell you that as as the as the statue itself started to age, it turned from brown to green. And the Army Corps of Engineers wanted to paint it brown so it would stay brown. There was an uproar. There was an uproar. So if you can visualize in your mind's eye the Lady Liberty in a coat of brown, it's almost too, too, too difficult to imagine. Too difficult to imagine. Which goes to show you, never let an engineer, never let an engineer do, do something like that. Um, they may have, they may be well intentioned, but uh, it was the worst thing that could happen. And besides, the actual uh, oxidation that was taking place was actually preserving the metal. Uh, they had a very poor understanding of that. But when Emma Lazarus wrote that poem, she had to be convinced to write it. She was offered the opportunity, and she said, no, I'm, I'm not going to do it. And the reason for the, for the request was they needed money to pay for the pedestal. I mean, Liberty, they had, they had the statue, but they had nothing on which to put it. And it was kind of like Lee Iacocca years ago when he, he went around and, and raised money for the refurbishing uh, of, the, uh, of the statue. Uh, they needed money for the pedestal. And what would the statue be if it was just sitting on, on the ground on Ellis Island? It wouldn't be very impressive. So the pedestal itself was very important. So they asked, they asked Emma Lazarus to write the poem, and she said, no way, Jose. She said, I'm not going to do it. 
And one of her friends came to her and said, you will be memorialized in history for what you write. Please write something appropriate. And she did. She wrote the New Colossus. And it took about 30 years before somebody said, you know, this is the exact words that we want to put on the base of the statue. And that's where it's, there are plaques all over, not just in the Statue of Liberty, but all over the United States, which reflect her words. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore, send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me, I lift my lamp beside the golden door. You can't say it any better than that. Uh, and that, those are the words that are quoted more often. I think the whole poem is important to be read because it gives, it gives the background of what she was comparing. She was comparing Lady Liberty to this Colossus, which doesn't exist anymore. The Colossus at Rhodes was one of the wonders of the ancient world, but it's gone. And nobody knows what happened to it. Next, another question, another question. Are we, are we ready for questions? No, not yet. No, 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 no. Oh, no, I'm nowhere near finished, Joe. I've got another 15 minutes. Oh, I, I, need, I, need my next, I need my next slide, though. I need my next slide. There he is, Hausman. Another question comes up. A.E. Hausman wrote a great poem to an athlete dying young. Okay? It also was in a movie, a prominent part of a movie. See, see if somebody can get that one. Okay? Now we move on to what I consider to be something that I had an education on when I put this together. Next slide, please. Paul Dunbar. When I, was, when I was a student, when I was in grammar school, when I was in high school, when I was in college, I didn't know who Paul Dunbar was. I didn't know any of the black poets. And today, uh, they've issued stamps. Paul Dunbar's been on a stamp. Langston Hughes has been on a stamp. And as you, as you read more about these people, you read how important what they wrote was when they wrote it. And we're only now in the, in the 2020-2021 era of our life beginning to understand the importance of what they wrote. Paul Dunbar wrote, and this one, this one is a very short poem, it's called The Debt. I'll read it in its entirety. This is the debt I pay just for one riotous day. Years of regret and grief, sorrow without relief. Pay it I will to the end until the grave, my friend, gives me a true release, gives me the clasp of peace. Slight was the thing I bought Small was the debt, I thought. Poor was the loan at best. God, but the interest. This was written by a black man because they were the ones that were being, shall I say, disadvantaged. Dunbar wrote, he was, he was I found, I didn't realize this, but I, I know the title. Uh, I know what the caged bird feels. I think that's one of from one of, of Dunbar's poems. But what I, want to, what I want to show you is how talented this young man was. And this one I don't have a slide for, so I'm going to have to read it. Uh, he was 16 years old. Uh, his parents were former slaves. His father uh, had served in the, uh, in, the, in the Union in the Civil War, and he was always very proud of his father's service. And his first poem, this is his first poem, and it was written about, he lived in the, uh, in the uh, area around Dayton, Ohio, and there's a, a national cemetery at, in Dayton. <clears throat> and Paul Dunbar wrote this one, it's called, I'll read, I'll read a couple of sections from it. Our martyred 
soldiers. You've got to remember, he was 16 years old. In homes all green, but cold in death, robbed of the blessed boon of breath, resting in peace from field and fray, our martyred soldiers sleeping lay. Beneath the dew, the rain, the snow, they heed no more the bloody foe. Their sleep is calm, to them alone, tis given to lie without a moan. And he goes on for another three or four paragraphs, and then he concludes and says, Sleep on, ye soldiers, men of God, a nation's tears bedew the sod. Tis but a short, short time till ye shall through the shining portals flee. And when this memory lost shall be, we turn, O Father God, to thee. O find in heaven some nobler thing than martyrs of which men can sing. Sixteen years old. Sixteen years old. And he went on, he went on to write and write and write great poetry. And I'm only now beginning to appreciate the poetry of some of these, shall I say, uh, underappreciated poets. They were underappreciated not because what they were writing was not well written. They weren't appreciated because of their color. Let's face it. Now, I'm going to move on to one that I consider. And I'm, oh, I got till, uh, till 8 o'clock, right, Joe? You got the whole night. No, I'm not going to take the whole night. But I have, I, I want to move on, I want to move on to the 1900s. And our next one is Thomas Hardy. We all know who Thomas Hardy is. He wrote some great novels. Uh, Far from the Madding Crowd, Jude the Obscure, The Mayor of Casterbridge. You can go on and on and on. But he was a wonderful poet. And he wrote what I have what I believe is one of the great op-ed pieces. He wrote this uh, at the time of the Boer War in South Africa. And he was writing about the futility of war. And he uses one word in the, uh, in the first paragraph. Before I read it, I want you to understand what it means. It's nipperkin. It's the last word in the first paragraph. And then if you, if you don't have a dictionary handy, I'll give you an idea what it is. It's like a shot of whiskey. It's a, uh, it, it's a, it's a small amount, of, like a shot glass of, of whiskey. And he wrote, this is, the, this is the man he killed. Had he and I but met by some old ancient inn, we should have sat us down to, <coughs> excuse me, wet, ready, write many a nipperkin. But ranged as infantry, and staring face to face, I shot at him as he at me, and killed him in his place. I shot him dead because, because he was my foe, just so. My foe, of course he was, that's clear enough, although he thought he'd list, perhaps offhand, like just as I was out of work, had sold his traps, no real other reason why. Yes, quaint and curious war is. You shoot a fellow down, you treat if met where any bar is, or help to half a crown. This poem, when it was written, got more coverage at the time than any poem of a era. Uh, he, uh, he said it all in, what, two, four, five, five short stanzas about the futility of war. Again, something that we don't fully appreciate until we read it and understand it. But then during World War I, war to end all wars, we had three great poets, young poets, who died in that war. And Rupert Brooke is a British poet, and he wrote a poem that I think you should hear because it is so deep, and it is very brief. It's called The Soldier. If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. There shall be in that rich earth a richer dust concealed, a dust whom England bore 
shaped, made aware, gave once her flowers to love, her ways to roam. A body of England's breathing English air, washed by the rivers, blessed by sons of home. And think this heart all evil shed away, a pulse in the eternal mind no less gives somewhere back the thoughts by England given. Her sights and sounds, dreams happy as her day, and laughter learned of friends and gentleness in hearts at peace under an English heaven. The man was killed. Actually, he died on his way to Gallipoli. And uh, would have died probably in Gallipoli if he had ever gotten there, but he died on a troop, troop ship on his way. But those are, those are words that you could write a book on, but he says it in, in, in a sonnet, 14 lines, 14 lines. Then we move on, one more, Lieutenant Colonel John McRae. We've all heard this one, I'm sure we have. It's something that as students, we've heard it. McRae was another one died in World War I. In Flanders fields the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place, and in the sky the larks, still bravely singing, fly scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. I always loved this poem because it was, it was uh, a tribute to the dead, those who had died and who were buried over there in, in Europe. I always found it somewhat ironic that most times you hear it said, you go back, go back one, uh, uh, if you can, back to the poem. There we go. In the uh, last paragraph, you hear too many people say, to you from falling hands we throw. It's not falling hands, it's failing hands. And there's a big difference in the wording. But for whatever reason, you'll hear many people say, to you from falling hands we throw. Well, it's not falling, it's failing. And I think that that's, the difference in words, is it makes a great difference in meaning. Just thought I'd mention it. Next one, Joyce Kilmer. Rutgers taught Latin in the high school in Morristown, New Jersey. Worked for Funk and Wagnalls, had five children, and enlisted in 1917 to go over to Europe to help in the struggle over there. He was killed by a sniper about a year later. He was with the Fighting 69th, and his most famous poem, um, again, this is one of these that we, we always hear when we're when we're young, when we're children. Next one. Trees. And this is what everybody associates with Joyce Kilmer. I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree, a tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against the earth's sweet flowing breast, a tree that looks at God all day and lifts her leafy arms to pray, a tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair, upon whose bosom snow has lain, who intimately lives with rain. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. Now we learn that one, why? Because it's simple, and uh, it's easy to learn, and it's very comfortable. But he wrote some great poetry. And one of the ones, I just want to read a few lines from a poem that he wrote while observing the burial of 
literally the bodies of so many who were killed in an aerial bombardment during the war. And it is called the Rouge Bouquet. In a wood they call the Rouge Bouquet, there is a new made grave today. Built by never a spade nor pick, yet covered with earth ten meters thick. There lie many fighting men, dead in their youthful prime, never to laugh nor love again, nor taste the summertime. For death came flying through the air and stopped his flight at the dugout stair, touched his prey and left them there, clay to clay. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I, I, I call upon you, pick up, pick up a book and read it. But this is what he says. This is how he closes. He says, farewell, comrades true, born anew. Peace to you. Your souls shall be where the heroes are, and your memories shine like the morning star. Brave and dear, shield us here. Farewell. Those are, I, I, I recommend some of, of his poetry to you. It's beautiful poetry, and it's a, it's a pity that his, uh, his, shall I say, his, he's best known for just one, and that is Trees, which is a, a, a wonderful poem, a very, uh, very good poem, but certainly he wrote so much more. I'm going to wrap it up uh, with one last comment from uh, a poem by name, a poet by the name of Langston Hughes, Again, another uh, poet who has been overlooked because of his color, and who was, shall I say, well ahead of his time, a hundred years ahead of his time. His probably most famous poem, at least the one that says the most, is I Too. I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes. But I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. You can't say it any better than that. And I, I'm going to leave you with that. I have so much more I could talk to you about. Uh, my favorite poem is, uh, poet is, is Robert Frost, but I'm not going to. And, that's a, that, and I could do a whole session on that one, uh, Joe, but I'm not going to uh, uh, go past the 8 o'clock. I said 8 o'clock, I would finish, and I have exactly 8 o'clock. We have a few questions. Go ahead. I'm going to pass go them over to you. Right you can read the questions. Read and Read the questions. OK. There's Mr. Kern. Through your, excuse me, through your life, has poetry become more or less popular with the public? Hmm. Interesting question. I think it has become less popular because it's not taught as often in schools as it used to be. It used to be part of every curriculum. Uh, elementary school, high school, college, if you got, if you got as far as as taking it, I, I I once I once took 22 credits in college, in one semester, 22. Somebody said you're crazy. 16 is the maximum. I said no. I took six credits, three three and three, and they were in the humanities courses, because I enjoyed them. Those are the courses that we took at four o'clock in the afternoon, where we sat around and we discussed things like this. We discussed poetry. We discussed meaning. And so to answer the question, uh, has it become more or less popular? I think, unfortunately, I think it's become a little less popular simply because we're not teaching it as often. Second question, what is the best way to get started reading poetry? Well, to get started reading poetry is to pick up, go to Barnes & Noble. Go to Barnes & Noble. Pick up a book like this. Pick, for five dollars, you can go to the remainder, to the remainder section, and they have they have wonderful books on poetry. They they have oh, 
Ozymandias. I met a traveler from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. We've all heard that one. But read the whole poem. Read it. Pick it up. You can pick up anything. I, I did this one for, for, for Jill tonight. I just, just pulling a poem out at random. We sleek it, cowering, timorous beastie. What was I talking about? We cow, we sleek it, cowering, timorous beastie. Robert Burns, while he was working out in the field, overturned a nest of mice. And he wrote a poem about it. He says, I'm truly sorry man's dominion has broken nature's social union and justifies that ill opinion which makes thee startle at me, thy poor earth-born companion and fellow mortal. I mean, that was written, that was written 1785. 200, almost 250 years ago. The, and they're and the social commentaries. They're social commentaries today. But you can pick up a book like this for five dollars. That's how you get started. Now my mother, as I think I pointed out, bought these books for me when I was 13, 12 or 13 years old. They were printed by, a, by a, uh, a firm by the name of Wise. I don't think they're in business anymore. But they were, they were originally printed, and it's an anthology of great poems written in 1926, put together by Edwin Markham. Edwin Markham. Uh, Edwin Markham was a great poet in his own right, but he created this wonderful anthology. What is my favorite all-time poem? Oh, my God. You're not going to ask me are these, are these people actually called in? Yeah, here? and they want to know why, not just the question of what is. Why. <laughs> mm. Well, I'll tell you why, okay? Uh, let me see if I can do it. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that sends the frozen ground swell under it and spills the upper boulders in the sun and makes gaps even too can pass abreast. The work of hunters is another thing. I have come after them and made repair where they have left not one stone on a stone, but they would have the rabbit out of hiding to please the yelping dogs. The gaps, I mean, no one has seen the maid or heard the maid, but at spring mending time we find them there. I let my neighbor know beyond the hill, and on a day we meet to walk the line and set the wall between us once again. We keep the wall between us as we go. To each the boulders that have fallen to each, and some are loaves, and some so nearly balls. We have to use a spell to make them balance. Stay where you are until our backs are turned. We wear our fingers rough with handling them. Oh, just another kind of outdoor game, one on the side. It comes to little more. There where it is, we do not need the wall. He is old pine, and I am apple orchard. My apple trees will never get across and eat the cones under his pines, I tell him. He only says, Good fences make good neighbors. Spring is the mischief in me, and I wonder if I could put a notion in his head. Why do they make good neighbors? Isn't it where there are cows? But here there are no cows. Before I built a wall, I'd ask them what I was walling in or walling out, and to whom I was like to give a fence. Something there is that doesn't love a wall and wants it down. I could say elves, Sam, but it's not elves exactly, and I'd rather he said it for himself. I see him there bringing a stone grass firmly by the top in each hand, like an old stone savage armed. He moves in darkness, as it seems to me, not of woods only and the shade of trees. He will not go behind his father's saying, and he likes having thought of it so well. He says again, good fences make good neighbors. Now, that is by one of my favorite poets, Robert Frost. And uh, Joe, Joe always asked me the question, how, how did I learn that one? I, I mean, that, this, this is, I mean, I don't study these every day, so I, I can come and sit in front of you and recite these. Joe, shall I tell them what, uh, what I told you as to where I learned that? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah well, yeah. Uh, I learned that one in detention in high school. <laughs> <laughs> the prefect of discipline 
used to give us uh, a number of lines of, uh, of a particular poem uh, that we had to learn. If we learned those before the hour and a half in detention was up, we could leave early. And uh, I became very proficient at learning, uh, learning poetry uh, so I could reduce my, my time in detention. I was not a, uh, shall I say, uh, the perfect student. Uh, uh, like uh, most students in high school, we all uh, you know, found, found reason to be in detention at the end of the day. But it's something that, uh, well, I will say one thing, that if you're in detention and you're given a project like that, you come out of it with, uh, with something of value. And I think that's always stuck with me. I always loved that particular poem because it's too often misunderstood. Too often you see, you see signs that say, good fences make good neighbors. Well, that's, it, Frost is saying just the opposite. He's, he is mocking. He's mocking the neighbor for saying that. But uh, uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting. So that's all. I don't know if you have any others, Joe. Did anybody come in with the answers to my questions? I haven't seen any. And we had a car we wanted to give away, but I guess we'll hold well, that for a later. Well, I'm going, to tell you, I'm going to tell you that that the charge of the light brigade was in the, was in the blind side, uh, that recent movie with Sandra Bullock. And uh, Tim McCraw, who was uh, her husband in that movie, recites it in a very uh, meaningful way. And uh, uh, the other one which I, I referred to, which was to an athlete dying young, that was uh, in uh, Out of Africa, in which Meryl Streep recites it. Uh, over the grave of her, uh, shall I say, fallen lover. But uh, two, uh, two very, uh, shall I say, moving moments where they, they use poetry to, to create a, a meaning. So I enjoyed this evening. I hope that you did. Uh, I, I, don't, uh, uh, I don't relish the opportunity to sit here and, uh, and do it again because I'm afraid. I'm afraid that I might get into trouble the next time. But uh, I did enjoy the opportunity, and I hope that I did give you a little bit of something to think about. Poetry does have a, a very strong social message, uh, more so today than it did, shall I say, back in the times of Homer or Virgil. Uh, but certainly uh, uh, it is something that more people should uh, should take the opportunity to learn and to enjoy. So thank you very much.